Thank you for letting me come and speak today. I'm Lynn Ravis. Um, I have been very fortunate in my lifetime to have met quite a few survivors, and as well as having read many of their memoirs, as some of you may have done. What is most important for us to remember is that just as your situation in life is unique, whether it's from your parents, your siblings, your peers, your friends, each of us walks our own path. And so you might read about two people who were in the same camp and had very different experiences. That does not change the impact because everyone's experience is unique. Two children in hiding are going to have very different experiences even if they were in the same place because they're a different age, they process things differently. So we must respect and remember that every story we hear is special and every story deserves our respect. The story that I'm going to share today is a little bit different than many of the Holocaust stories you may have read or heard before because it begins here in the United States. In 1935, a young couple by the name of Francie and Bernie gave birth to their daughter. And of course, they were thrilled. But they were also saddened because the doctor told them that they could not have any more children without risking Francie's health. They had had a son three years earlier, and he died within a few hours of birth. So Francie and Bernie were both heartbroken over the fact that the doctor said they couldn't have any more children after already having experienced tragedy. And so they started thinking about what were their options. And in 1935, here in the United States, adoption was a very different process than what we know of today. There was no foster care. Children lived in an orphanage until someone came and took them home. And Francie and Bernie certainly thought about that. But being a Jewish couple, in New York City, they also were very well aware of what was happening in Germany in 1935. And although their families were safe, they thought, in other countries, they thought about what could we do besides just adopting a child? Why not adopt a child who has no one to protect him or her from the Nazis? And so they decided that they were going to adopt a child, a Jewish child from Germany. But it's 1935. You cannot Google Jewish orphanages in Germany. So where do you start? In 1935, you had the options of airmail, which was very expensive. You could put a letter on a ship to go across the Atlantic Ocean, and that could take a couple of weeks to reach its destination. You could send a telegram, but you had to know where to send that as well. A phone call was outrageously expensive in 1935 to go across the ocean. So they really were struggling. How could they find where there were Jewish children in Germany that they could adopt one and not only fulfill their family goals, but protect a child who was completely unprotected from the Nazis, from family to help that child? So they were really struggling. How did they figure this out? And fortunately, Francie's sister had a neighbor who had recently hired a housekeeper. And that housekeeper had come from a small town in Germany, and she had been in a Jewish orphanage. And so now they knew exactly where one was. And here was someone firsthand knowledge who could tell them about the children. Francie and Bernie were thinking about a little boy between the ages of one and five. They really kind of thought about an older brother for their new daughter, maybe about the age that their son would have been, but they were willing to take any small child. It didn't have to be an infant by any means. They really didn't want an infant. So Francie and Bernie, with the help of this recent immigrant, contacted the orphanage in a small town, and they were living in the Bronx in New York. Anybody ever been to the Bronx? They talk funny there? Okay, yeah, okay. We don't talk funny in Pittsburgh. Anyway, <laughs> they were living in the Bronx, and this orphanage was in the town of Dinslagen in Germany. A small little town had approximately 300 uh, Jewish residents, not a big town at all, just a small town, and it had a Jewish orphanage. There were really three Jewish orphanages that the Jewish society had organized. There was one in Cologne, Germany, 
And then there were two more, one was in Amsterdam and one was in Belgium. So this one in Dinslagen, Francie and Bernie contacted and explained that they wanted to adopt a child. And of course they were thrilled because they want their children to go to a home. So it took a while before Francie and Bernie could work out all the details to actually get on a ship and sail across the Atlantic Ocean to get to Europe and then get transportation to get them to this little town in Dinslagen. And once they arrived there, this was the orphanage that was um, in the town of Dinslagen, the Jewish orphanage. There were usually 35 children, give or take, living in that orphanage, and they were from the ages of two to 16. The children younger than two were in a different orphanage. So once a child reached two, they were sent over to this one. This was the entire world for those children. It was their home, their school, their social life because they had nowhere else to go. They had no family to take them anywhere else. It was a lovely place to grow up. Uh, headmaster ran the orphanage. There were teachers who were there, of course, to give the children their education. And there were people to cook and clean and take care of them. Somebody to be there at night when the children went to bed because they couldn't be by themselves. And think about feeding 35 children, okay? and let alone the adults who were working there as well. But it was a very nice place. As you can see here in the dining room, these are some um, postcards that the orphanage issued back then to show people what the orphanage was like, sort of advertising. So for the older children, they could sit with their friends and talk during their meals. Most of us, <coughs> excuse me, are familiar with the children's table where you, <coughs> excuse me, the place where you have to sit, where somebody's gonna help you cut your food and make sure you practice your manners. They had that for the younger children. They had their school. With 35 children, you may have had only one or two to a grade level. So it may have been similar to some of your experiences where you have multiple grade levels going on in the same room. That's what they were doing here. They did take the children on outings to try and make um, a happy life for these children. This is a picture from when they went to the beach. They went up towards the North Sea and they went to the beach, so they did have some fun. They had a picnic in the backyard. Some of the similar types of things that children with families would experience. And of course, you've got the smaller children here, which always appeals to people. <clears throat> this is my favorite picture because it's the backyard. And wouldn't you love it if you were allowed to swing like that on that swing set? <laughs> Safety rules have changed a great deal since then, especially with somebody sitting on the top of the swing set. Can you see him up there on the right? And the ping pong table right behind the swing set. Oh, okay. They must have had a lot of fun there. But this was their social life. This is their free time to be out there with the other children. So Francie and Bernie did traveled to the town of Dinslagen, and they spent a few days there getting to know the children and picking out the little boy that they wanted to take home. But it's never that simple. Even though by the time they traveled there, remember I said they started this process in 1935, they traveled there in 1936, they uh, had to go back again, they, they made more than one trip over, and by 1937, they were starting to get the paperwork together so that they could adopt the child. But Germany said, whoa, we may not want the Jews in this country, but why is somebody taking Jews out of our country? Mm, we're a little suspicious here. And the US government, specifically the State Department said, whoa, you're bringing refugees into this country? Does this sound familiar today? Mm-hmm. How do we know that the, these children, because Francie and Bernie weren't the only ones who were doing this. They had friends who were also wanting to adopt children from this orphanage or from the infant orphanage. And they said, you people want to bring these children over here? How do we know that you're really going to take care of them? Maybe you're going to get tired of them and leave them on the street, dump them somewhere on one of our organizations, and it becomes a burden to this government. How do we know they're not bringing illnesses? There's not something wrong with these children. So the State Department said, oh no, we're not issuing a visa until we get some paperwork. 
So Francie and Bernie had to start the paperwork. They had to get letters stating that Francie and Bernie were of good character. Now Francie was a teacher. She taught uh, high school English in Harlem. Bernie ran his own accounting business. So even though it was the Great Depression, they were financially secure. They had good jobs. They rented a duplex in the Bronx, so they had a home that they could bring a child to. They already had a child. And they started getting letters from people, their attorney, business friends. The chief of police had to write a letter saying that Francie and Bernie did not have any kind of criminal record. And all this paperwork has to go back and forth. And remember, you're sending this across the Atlantic Ocean. You can't just email it or fax it. So it takes a while. So Francie and Bernie are getting all of this paperwork together for the State Department, and then they send copies on to the American consul in Stuttgart so that Germany has proof of all of that. The United States says that the children need a physical exam to prove that they're not carrying any illnesses or diseases, there's not any problem, and they needed a psychological exam. So Francie and Bernie had to send money over to Germany to the orphanage. They then hired the doctors who did all the tests, get the results, send it back. So you can see how this would take a while. And in the process, Francie and Bernie received a letter from the orphanage saying, we're very sorry, but the little boy that you selected has been adopted by somebody else. However, if you will recall, there was another little boy who might be of interest to you, and his name is Hans. Francie said, absolutely, she remembered Hans. Francie wanted a son. She said, just give me a little boy. So the orphanage sent these pictures over to help them remember what the little boy Hans looked like. Francie said, absolutely, we will take him. So it meant a new physical, new psychological, change the names on all the paperwork, and it took a while. But finally, by the fall of 1938, all the paperwork was taken care of. The U.S. government said everything was all right, and Germany said it was all right, and the orphanage said, you can start making arrangements to come over and pick up your little boy. It was the fall of 1938, and before Francie and Bernie could get over there, November 9th and 10th, 1938, Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass. You might be familiar with that. And in the New York Times, just like many other papers around the United States, there were headlines of synagogues burning, of reports of businesses being looted and homes being looted in Germany and Austria. And in the Jewish newspaper in the Bronx, there were reports of it. And Francie and Bernie were heartsick. They had no way of knowing what was going on. Again, trying to get in touch with the orphanage and find out were they okay. And it took a couple of days before all the information came out. And what had happened was, on November 9th, three military men showed up at the orphanage and told the headmaster to close all the blinds on the front of the building. Remember that two-story building? Because they did not want anyone watching what was happening on the street outside. They were told to stay inside with all the blinds closed. The next day, 50 men showed up at the orphanage. And they told the headmaster, some of these men are carrying guns, some of them are in uniform, the local police, the Nazi officers, whatever, local people in town, said to the headmaster, round up all of these children. And the headmaster decided that probably the safest thing for the children was to get them out on the street where other people could see what was going on. So he yelled to the children to run out into the street. The little boy Hans that Francie and Bernie wanted to adopt was at that time six years of age. And even though you might see a police officer or a person in uniform that you think is supposed to help you, when you hear them yelling at you to get out of your own home, small children especially, and even people our ages would panic. Hans ran down a hallway, and there were French glass doors, the kinds that swing open. He didn't take time to turn the handles. He just shoved on those doors. And in the process, the glass broke and cut his arm, but he kept running. And he ran out there in that backyard 
that we looked at, where there were hedges in the far back, and he hid there. Because if you've ever played hide and seek with small children, you know they think that if they can't see you, you can't see them, even if their legs are sticking out, okay? And that's what he did. He hid in those bushes. But of course, the men who were there ordered the teachers to go round up all the children. And it was decided that they would be taken to a location in Dinslagen where other Jewish families had been taken. And they were held there for several days. When they returned to the orphanage, it too had been looted. You see, people fell into that trap of believing stereotypes. And the stereotype is if someone's Jewish, they have to be wealthy. That's the stereotype. One of them. These are orphans. They had nothing. But people were saying, sure, they might be an orphan, but somebody had to leave them something. They've got money, they've got jewelry, they've got stock certificates. They have to have something. And so people went in to the orphanage while the children were gone, and they went into the kitchen and ripped open great big bags of flour, rice, beans, you know, the quantities you'd need to feed 35 children at a time, because they thought something might be hidden in those bags. They dumped out all of the food they could find to make sure nothing was stashed. They ripped the kitchen cabinets off the walls, looking for hidden compartments behind it. They didn't find anything. So they went upstairs to the children's bedrooms, and they ripped open their mattresses and pillows. And when they didn't find anything there, they'd already broken out all the windows in the building as part of their anger towards the Jews. And so they started throwing the furniture out the second floor window to shatter on the ground below because they thought maybe somebody had hollowed out the leg of a chair or a bed and hidden something up there. So if it shattered, it would be out on the street for somebody to get. They didn't find anything. They went into the bathrooms and they ripped the sinks and toilets off the walls looking for hidden compartments in the pipes. Nothing. After about five days, the headmaster was told to take the children back to the orphanage. And of course, they couldn't take the children in there because it was too dangerous. Broken glass, food all over, splintered wood. And the children slept in that backyard for about two nights afterwards until the adults could clean it up enough to take them in safely. And then the decision was made to make the town of Dinslagen Judenrein, free of all Jews. And so it was decided that all the Jewish families would report at a certain time with the belongings they could carry, and they would be marched out of town under gunpoint and taken to trucks that would take them somewhere else. Many of the men had already been arrested, so it was mostly the women and children who had been left behind or the elderly people. The children from the orphanage were also going to be taken out of town, but the Nazis had a bit of a problem. Where were they going to take all these orphans who didn't have families to care for them? So they told the headmaster to make arrangements, and he could temporarily take the children to the other Jewish orphanage in Cologne, but only temporarily. They couldn't stay there. So at the designated time, the families did report to the center of town. And we have the testimony of one young man whose family was in that group. And he said, as they stood there in the street, waiting for the orders to march down the street, uh, out of town where the trucks were, the non-Jewish people of Dinslagen stood along the sides of the street on the sidewalks and spit on them and threw rocks and called them names. They were glad to see the Jews gone. Many of the children at the orphanage were too young to walk that distance, and so the Nazis allowed the headmaster to arrange for what's called a rick wagon, which is sort of a farm wagon, the kind that you could put an animal to. It's got the long arms on it, and you lift it up, and you can push it. So they put the smaller children in the rick wagon, and four of the older children then pushed that down the road until they went to the transportation that would take them to Cologne. From Cologne, the children were divided into two groups. Half the children went to Belgium and the other half went to Amsterdam. Hans was in the group who went to Amsterdam. 
Francie and Bernie finally received a telegram telling them that Hans was safely in Amsterdam, but again, he needed a new physical and a new psychological exam because he was in a different country. And so, again, getting all the paperwork together, that it took more time. Finally, by April of 1939, Hans was placed on a ship to sail to the United States. Now, he couldn't travel by himself. He was just turning seven years of age. He could not travel that long. Francie and Bernie had had to send the money over for his ticket on the ship and all of his expenses. They had to pay for someone to accompany him and uh, pay for that person's expenses as well. And again, this is still the Great Depression. Even though they had jobs, this is not easy for them, but this is how badly they wanted this little boy. So in April, the end of April 1939, a ship lands in Hoboken, New Jersey, and a little boy gets off. He is seven years old. He speaks no English. He has been told, you are going to a new country, to a new family, and they don't speak your language. It's got to be frightening for anybody. Fortunately for Hans, Francie did speak several languages, including German. So she was able to communicate with him when he got off the ship that day. And when he got off the ship that day, he was wearing this little pair of lederhosen. And you can see they're kind of dirty, stained, worn. He was an orphan. He didn't have much. And he was wearing this little jacket as well that's missing a button. So Francie and Bernie immediately took him shopping to get some new clothes so that he would have some things. And they had decided that Hans needed an American name. And remember, Francie wanted a little boy, so she named him Fred, okay? And they took Fred home, and she started teaching him a little bit of English. And he wanted so badly to be an American that when people would speak to him in German, with his thick German accent, he would say, I don't speak German, because he didn't want to. You see, when he was enrolled in school, he got in trouble one day with his teacher in the third grade. And the teacher said to him, if you don't behave, we're going to send you back to Germany. And that was the country that didn't want him to begin with. And he didn't know where he would go when he was sent back. It took Francie a few days to convince him to go back to school that everything would be all right. Francie said that for the first few months that Fred lived with them, every time he heard a siren, he would run and hide. Because in Germany, a siren meant an air raid drill, planes coming to bomb. And if you've ever been to New York City, you know how many sirens you can hear. Police cars, ambulances, fire trucks. And they tried to explain to him that that meant people were coming to help. Fred did eventually get rid of his German accent and did get a very good Bronx accent and become a typical American boy playing stickball in the streets of New York City in the 1940s. And he was excellent at skipping school, despite the fact that his mother was a teacher. In fact, she wasn't sure he was going to graduate from high school. He had missed so much. But she did manage to get him through. And this is the visa that he came with when he got off the ship that day. You've heard that term visa with the news. You see his German identity card, just as so many, uh, as everybody else had to carry. Francie got him through high school, sent him off to college where he married a young woman and they had four children and I am the oldest of those four children. This is my dad's story. This is how close I came to not being here. There is a Jewish proverb that says, when you save one life, you save the world. Francie and Bernie wanted a little boy to complete their family, and they made the decision to save someone who couldn't save himself. But they didn't save just one child, because they saved my three brothers, and me, and my parents' 10 grandchildren, and so far, four great-grandchildren. What you do can make such a difference in the life of one other person. You may never see it, you may never know it, but that ripple effect is there. 
On the 50th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the town of Dinslagen erected a memorial, and I think this is one of the best memorials I've ever seen to the Holocaust victims. You see, the town of Dinslagen knew the decisions they had made, and they wanted future generations to consider those decisions. Because you have the choice of standing where the Nazi officers stood as the perpetrator, you can stand here at this railing along the sidewalk as one of those supposed bystanders. I don't believe in the term bystander because by not doing anything, they did something. Or you can stand at the Rick wagon with all of the victims. That wagon is breaking through a wall. Think symbolism, because it came out on the other side. When you look through, you can see that there's some writing on the wall. And up close, on one side of the wall are the names of all the Jewish families who had lived in Dinslagen prior to Kristallnacht. And on the other side of the wall are the names of the children from the orphanage. My dad's name is right here. Always remember, you can make a difference. And one small decision can last generations. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for letting me speak today. Uh, my name is Sam Gardesman. I was born in the eastern part of Czechoslovakia called the Carpathian Mountain region. We were a family of four girls, three boys, mom and dad, and we also had an extension of the families like my grandparents are also aunts and uncles and about 45 cousins that we had living in that hometown. Everything went out okay as long as the Czech Republic existed. I came in 1938 when Germany marched into Prague, destroyed the Czech Republic and we all of a sudden overnight became a totally new nation called Hungary. Uh, the reason for it, that Hungary owned that part way before World War I called the Austria-Hungary uh, uh, Consolation. Anyway, we will learn, learn, lived a normal life there until, I say, 1938. And when the Hungarians came in, and they uh, issued totally new laws, restricted the Jewish population of the country to certain areas, to certain uh, professions, we had to apply for the, anything that we operated, like stores or professions, or masters of some kind of a uh, uh, teachers or uh, professors and uh, came in 1940 uh, 19, uh, all of a sudden the, uh, the uh, order came from Budapest that we are not to practice our whatever that you did whether you were in business or in a profession, or you're a shoemaker, tailors, or cabinet makers. You had to apply for the uh, permit to operate it. And of course, uh, about three months later, you got rejected. In other words, you had no way of making a uh, legitimate living. And most of the time, the young people of that area were called in to the Hungarian army and so only thing you had at home were the elderly, the sick, and the mother, if, uh, women with the children. So naturally it was already difficult for a regular family to live a normal life. The community had to organize and to see that the poorest one of them all, that they have some sort of a help, 
some sort of assistance to have some bread on the table for the kids. And the things started to get more difficult. The order was again that we are to prove that we are citizens of Hungary. We either were born there or we've been living there for at least 200 years, going back three generations. Of course, a lot of people were new citizens that came back from Poland, from Russia, from Ukraine. And after World War I, they moved into our countries and they made their livings there and their homesteads was there too. But the order came one Sunday morning on 1941 that those families who could not prove that they were citizens of Hungary at that time are to pack up and to report to the police stations. What happened is they had to leave their homes, had to leave whatever they had, and they were packed up put on trains, and they were uh, shipped across the border. The border at that time was Poland. And of course, we did not know what happens when they get to Poland. There were no radios announcing all these kind of things. The papers didn't mention anything happening on the Polish side of the border. But anyway, first of all, those people, there were hundreds and thousands of them who were not citizens of Hungary and wound up in Poland. And here and there we got some news of them, which was not very good. They were living in camps, they were living in school buildings, and naturally they had no way of making a living. In the total, total the uh, local community had to, the Jewish community that is, had to make sure that they have at least one meal a day. And that, imagine a family who just left a home, left everything there, and wound up in some city or some village in Poland, and they had to figure out how to feed a family. Uh, how much food they, they gathered from the Jewish agency. So it was, uh, Ill, I cannot describe it. A, uh, it's just what, what the people told us after the war, what it was like. Anyway, that was for the them. The, the ones we lived in Hungary, I remember we had no way of making a living. So there was all kinds of ways on, on black market, on the dark, on the uh, under uh, industries that were trying to make it some people can at least exist or have a little loan. Don't forget it was a war. Everything was on uh, tickets, on uh, coupons. You had your sugar, your flour, your oil, and you had to, instead of having all four or five grocery or supermarkets in one town, which was owned mostly by Jews, all of a sudden they were closed up and native Hungarians took charge of it. But instead of having four or five grocery stores, all of a sudden there was only one supermarket and you had to stand in line, get up early six o'clock in the morning or so, to make sure that the uh, coupons that you have, at least you get, you get the, uh, at least you get some bread or some flour or some sugar or whatever oil you'll have for the week. And uh, that was going on every month. It was a struggle to get those coupons exchanged for food. And a lot of times when it came to the around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, in the owner of the store said, we are out of it already. Uh, we closed the stores and there was 
no way of getting anything for the dead today. So where was starvation, there was a lot of uh, poverty, people were starving, people were, didn't have enough for the heating the, the homes that they lived in. It was awful, that's all I can say. Uh, what this happened next is, uh, this is the real story. Came 1944 on uh, March, when the Germans marched in into Budapest and took over the Hungarian government, which was mainly, uh, say, a humane government to that point. They followed the German laws against the Jews, but at least we were left alone. We were living in our homes, and we had a little bit of freedom, whatever we, did, we were able to do. But came in uh, 44 when the Germans marched in, it was a whole new story. First of all, the order was every Jew is supposed to display his Star of David, yellow Star of David, on his jacket, on the, on the pain of a fine. You could not travel on by train or by bus unless you had a uh, permit from the gendarme or the police that you had to have a reason, a very good reason, that you wanted to go to the big city for something, whether it was health reason or, or uh, fa family reasons. Anyway, the laws restricted the Jews to their homes. They could not move around freely. Came April 1944, on the 1st, the 10th of April, the order was a Sunday morning, and the order was that we are to take along only what we can carry with ourselves, and uh, by noon you have to report yourself at the synagogue courtyard. Now you can imagine what kind of a uh, mess that caused it. We did not know where they were going to take us. We did not know what happens when we get to the synagogue courtyard. What are we going to do there? We had no idea what is expecting of us, but the order was by noon, which gave us about four hours to prepare yourself and to report to the family at to that courtyard. What do you do when grandma is sick, or the baby is sick, or the baby just been born and uh, you have to have special food for it? All these questions came facing you right there and there. You had a number of three or four kids. You had to make sure that they have their clothes. And don't forget, the husband was not home. He was in the army. But by then, the army turned down into the labor camps. They were all working in the labors. So they were not even soldiers anymore. But the fact is that at home, all there was was mom, with three or four, five <coughs> children, and grandpa or grandma there living with them. And you were ordered out of the house. What happens? Where do we go? What, what can we do? With, what can we take along? What is important to take along? Is it going to be, it's April, it's still cold. Are we going to be in the summertime somewhere? Are we going to be with the winter time? So you had decisions to be made, and you had no way of knowing what kind of decision to make. Is it going to be summer? Is it going to be winter? What happens when you get there, wherever they were going to go? Where are they taking us? All these questions that came facing out, and there was no answer from anybody, so nobody knew what happens tomorrow. And we, uh, the, uh, finally, when we finally arrived at the uh, courtyard with all those packages that we could carry ourselves along, and remember we left the houses 
the doors wide open with everything in there, and uh, we had to report there. So the order came around 4 o'clock, there were some German officers and came, inspected us, and ordered us into the ghetto. What they meant by ghetto, they picked about four or five houses from one of the streets close to the, to the uh, courtyard, and we had to move in, and there was about 1,200 people in that yard, and we had to move in into those houses, and the house that carried a family living in there before, all of a sudden, three, and four, five families had to find themselves into those houses. And again, what do you do for food? What do you do for cooking? What do you do for medicine? What do you do, period? How do you live in one house with 50 or 60 people be put in in those houses? But we had no choice. We were sleeping on the floors, of course, if we had enough room there, and waiting for the next uh, shoe to drop. We still did not know what do they want from us, what do they want to do with us. And then finally, the Sunday came the answer again. We are to pick up our bundles and we are going to the train. Now we know we're going to be traveling, but where to? What happens when we get there? Where they're ever there, there is going to be. We had no idea where they're going to park us. Anyway, the, before we got to the train, we were ordered to come in into school buildings that was on the way to the train. And when we came in into the yard there, in the schoolyard, we were ordered to go in there, and there were some officers there, and we were ordered to open up your bundles, take out anything from your pocket, and put it on the tables. What happened there? It's a simply, uh, they called it robbery. They told us, you're going to get a receipt for whatever they're going to pick for you. But of course, he just did not want to believe it. But anyway, there was a lot of young people who had jewelry on them. They had to cash, whatever cash they had in the house, they had it on them because they didn't know where they will be. Wherever they will be, they will need the cash. And of course, they were ordered to take everything out of their pockets, put it on the table, and so they robbed us right there and then before we even got to the train. Finally, they, there was a lot of fighting going on, crying, like the young girl who didn't want to go give up her earrings or her ring or whatever she, uh, money she had uh, saved up. Hey, the order is, okay, now we are going to the train. We went, we started walking, dragging our, our packages or our rucksacks, if we had any, into the train, and they loaded us up on the train. And finally, the train started moving, and we moved in, and we arrived at the big city called Mungach. It was one of the 50,000 population big city. And they unloaded us from the train, and they taught us to walk to the end of the town, and there was a uh, lumber yard. We had to park ourselves in that lumber yard. So you can imagine it was wide open spaces. There's nothing but lumber, and this is where we were parked, and this is where we were gonna be, wait for something else to happen without knowing what the uh, next move would be. So you can imagine what that life would be like in a lumber yard when you had no bed to lay down, no table to do it. So we used the lumber as a table or a bed or whatever else we could, and no covering at all, and cooking naturally, 
there was no way of cooking. We had no food because we did not have bake anything. We had no p p p facilities to do that. And uh, we were lucky that the local Jewish population of the town of Munkach were still at home, and they were the ones who supplied us with some food. They brought in a wagon load of bread, flour, beans, corn, whatever else we could to cook. We had a, 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 a what do you call it, community, big c c uh, copper castles that we fired up and we were able to cook and everybody got a, a ladle full of uh, food for, for the day, as long as the munkach was keeping us going. And we were surrounded by wire and, of course, guarded by the gendarme. And, uh, and of course, with no help from anybody, and not knowing what happens next. Meanwhile, we saw uh, those trains, those boxcars, those cattle cars moving in into the camp, into that backyard. And uh, so we know they're going to transport us somewhere. And again, we did not know where. Uh, finally, the day came, and the order was we all, we were all to line the whole camp. There was about 32,000 population in that lumber yard. And we were all to line up, it says, uh, about 90 or 95 people per, per a row, and line up five to a row, and 95 people in a group, and you're waiting for the next order. Uh, the order was, uh, that came finally with uh, uh, a big officer, German officer, with two young ones in the, on his side with the uh, machine gun handy, and uh, looked us over and they ordered us this and this group, stay where you are, the rest of it can go back to the, wherever your place is. And then they started loading the train, those boxcars. Uh, there was about 11 or so of those boxcars, I remember counting them. And finally, when they loaded it up, the uh, people in the train, they uh, gave us two buckets, one for water and one for your physical needs. You can imagine that. Uh, as they uh, loaded the dust up, they finally they closed the, the, the gates and the train started moving. And again, we were wondering, where are we going? What happens when we get there? The story was that they're going to take us in the interior of Hungary. We will be working in a f farm. For, uh, we will be working in the fields. The kids will have kindergartens. Everything is going to be okay and not to worry about anything. Of course, the train started moving and it was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we drove through a whole night and the following day. But we indicated at one particular station that we will know whether we are going west back into the Hungarian area, or we are going east, which is Poland. So we finally, when we reached that station, we were very anxious to find out as to where which way is it going to go. And true enough, when the train started moving, we realized we are going east. East meant Poland, east meant uh, shall I say, uh, going into hell because we heard so many stories coming out from Poland as what's happening there. And we are going into that uh, place in, in ourselves. So we're again, we were wondering what happens when we get there, 
what is going on there because we had no idea exactly what is happening there. Anyway, when the train moved and we drove and we arrived very early in the morning and the train slowly started slowing down and we looked up through those little windows and what we saw we just could not imagine anything uh, a, a true this world. What we saw is people sitting on rocks in stars, crazy uniforms, striped uniforms, and cracking stones. You could not imagine what this is all about. But again, the train slowly, slowly started moving further away, and finally we arrived into a sort of a station, it looked like a station, and the trains made a full stop, and they opened up the gates, and uh, the word was only one thing, rouse, 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 means get out, and do not take anything with you. Leave everything in the train, you're going to come back for them later on. Now you all get up in men separate, and women separate, line up five per rows, and everybody gets in into lines and follow order, no talking, no crying, no sh changing around, no running around. Now you can imagine if 9,000 people come off a train and they're trying to find the family to find themselves and uh, to know where are we, what happens here. It was a whole commotion, crying and screaming and shouting in the dogs, jumping on you, make sure you're in line. And all these things suddenly hit you. You did not know you were in this world or some other crazy world that you never heard of before, you never saw before. Finally, when the, the line was made up and they started to told us to march forward. So every time we came, they were officers, German officers, and their hand was going just like this, right, left, right, left. Not a word, just moving. And you had to follow the order. Uh, there were the officers with the sticks. If you tried not to move or change their order, you uh, sure were reminded as where you are. And you still did not know where you are. What is this place all about? And so you all had to do, you became a omaton. You had to follow an order. And that was what they, to go right or to go left. And finally you found yourself all selected, the men on one side, women on one side, and you realize that your mom or your grandma or your aunts and uncles are all on, on the other side and dragging the kids on their hands and some of them are there, they, uh, three or four hanging on to them and they're walking to another side and that was the last time you saw some parts of your family. They're walking away to the left side, somewhere disappearing. That's all you know. And you still had no idea where you're at. Finally, we were told that we are in Auschwitz. What is Auschwitz? And of course we got two, what you call, uh, conflicting answers. Once, there were no striped uniforms were the ones who were helping us or ordering us, or telling us what to do, what not to do. He told us, don't worry, you will be all right, you, you will you will survive. The other one said, you heck, you heck, crazy guys, what makes you think you come here? Why didn't you do something that to, to be caught? And we didn't even know what he's talking about. And he points a finger at it to a distance there, there was some chimneys smoke coming out, and he says, you see that smoke? You know who that is? 
that's your aunt, that's your da dad, that's your mother, that's your grandparents, that's where they are. We, of course, did not want to believe. There, is, there must be sick in their mind to tell us the, the stupid things like that. But finally, it took us a while. It took me, personally, about six months to realize as whatever I was sold in Auschwitz, the first day I arrived there, it was true, just uh, the fact. And uh, we were lined up, and all those who were well enough marched off, and we parked ourselves in one of those barracks. And of course, there was three tiers, and he, five of us had to fit in in each tier. So the one at the end made sure that he's not falling off at the end from the... Uh, and it's all of us made out as the boards. There was nothing else there. And five of us had to fit in there. And the order, of course, was we had to line up for our first meal of the day, our first meal for three or four days that we, when we left the uh, camp. And uh, we were given a bowl and a spoon. He says, be careful, hold on to it, because this is the only one you get. And then, we then they took us to take a shower. And uh, we had to undress totally. And there were barbers lined up, about five of them. And we had to step forward. And they shaved us from head to toe. And then we had to go in and dunk in some warm, uh, the water was warm, but was uh, mixed with some chemicals. They said, since we were afraid that we might bring in some disease, typhoid that, or whatever, and this is what you call disinfections. So we t had that one. And instead of going back, to our clothes where we left it in that big hall with the numbers on them. And they told us to line up and go to the windows. And we were all given those striped uniforms that you see can there. And there, there it is. That's what everybody got a coat, a shirt, a long john, and a pair of pants. And they tossed a pair of shoes to you, regardless what size. They didn't ask you for sizes. They just tossed it at you, put it on, and that's it. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves no more human beings. And we were given numbers. And I remember mine, 370552, and uh, no more names. And this is how we arrived in Auschwitz. This is how we, they processed us in Auschwitz. Now, some of them who were there in a little longer, I was only there two days, so they did not put any numbers on, like, on my arm. They tattooed everybody by a number, except that they wanted to, they were taken in the Hungarian Jews. There was about 650,000 Jews they had a very short time to get rid of them or to do away with them because the Russians were moving. So they did not have to time to put everybody in with those numbers, but they put a number on your jacket. You marked the number there, 37052, and you had to memorize the number because that's what all you are. We were there in, in Auschwitz about two days, and then they put us on the train, and we wound up in the Schlesian mountain region called Wolfsburg, and we worked there. We arrived there in the end of April, and we were there, at least I was there, till February 1945, and then they put us on the march. We worked there, we dug, uh, water lines, we build buildings, massive buildings there because the cities were being bombed and they had to rebuild new towns in the wilderness. And this is where we had 2,000 inmates living in that 
barracks, and the food consisted of a coffee in the morning. We, they woke us up in the morning around five o'clock, and they told us that uh, the coffee was the first thing, but it wasn't a real coffee. It was uh, barley beans, and but it was liquid, and that's the only thing we gave us in the morning. And with that, we marched out each group to a, we were assigned to different types of works. I worked at a, a water line. We dug a canal from the mountain regions to into the city so that I'll have the water. We also did the coal mines. We also worked in building apartment buildings, not so much apartments, but housing. So we were poor, making the forms. The only thing we had was two German masters who were overseeing us, and we worked with them. And we worked a whole summer there, rain or shine. And the cold came already in October and November. In December, of course, then when the Russians started moving, they wanted, wanted to make sure that the Russians don't catch us. So they put us on the march. And the march took us from one end, Germany, or actually it was Czechoslovakia at that time, uh, up to the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, uh, Bremerhaven, if you know where that is. In that area, in the city of Hanover, we, we were marching all along. And don't forget, we stopped only once during the week. We wound up in the, uh, in the um, uh, farmland, and the, the, we spent the night in, in the, uh, b b uh, what do you call it, the b barn. And that's where the first time we got some food. When we left the camp, the original camp, we were given a loaf of bread and about six ounces of granulated sugar. So we walked the whole week, and that week, once we stopped at the farm, there finally they gave us about a third a loaf of a bread and a little margarine, and that was the food that we had for the rest for the week. And finally, when it came to the end of the week, they found a train, but uh, they were open uh, loading cars, so we were uh, under the weather, but at least we were T taken by train instead of having to walk across Germany, which a lot of uh, inmates did, and a lot of them never made it. There was people dying on the road because they couldn't take it anymore, with no food, with no covering, no, or anything like that. And they kept on going until they fall on their faces, and then the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, guards shot them dead and left them there, and there were thousands of us who died on that road to somewhere, nowhere, to a different camp actually. But these camps were so crowded when, when they started moving from the east, all those, uh, uh, what do you call it, the camps that they had there before, and they had to push them in into the other side of the Germany, in the western part. And uh, so finally, the, uh, the, the, the uh, war caught up with the Germans, and we were on the uh, 10th of April of 1945. One morning, then we were ordered also to evacuate, but they didn't have time anymore. They simply, the guards disappeared from the camps, and finally the Americans came upon us that night, and they um, inspected us, and they didn't know who we were because this is the first time they encountered a concentration camp. So uh, they looked at us, and they knew what we were dealing with. So they told us to stay here, not to go out because there was firing going on, all over the place, they were still fighting, you know, b blowing bridges, they're blowing all kinds of things. So we stayed in there and waited for the American to come, and they finally came in 
and they ordered us into a, into a sanatorium that, that they had. They uh, took it over, and there was about 80 of us left in that camp. And uh, we, did, we arrived there uh, Thursday night. The nurses in, the ca in that hospital shaved us down, washed us down, took every piece of clothes uh, from us because we were full uh, with lice and all kinds of things. Anyway, they, we were sleeping the first time in a bed with white sheets in a regular hospital. That was Thursday night. Friday, we were running around and expecting something to happen. We didn't know what. And uh, Saturday, it, me and the rest of them too came down with typhoid fever. Now you can imagine from the 80 or so, half of them probably didn't survive the typhoid. And I so happened did survive it. And we were in hospital six weeks. And finally they uh, <coughs> gave us, so the only thing we had was the hospital gown, but at least we had clean clothes there and we had some food from the hospital. And, uh, but then, of course, the uh, uh, time came that we had to get finally out and we had to start our, on our own. We were free to go, free to come, and Americans helped us as much as they could. And I decided to go back to home, or whatever home there was going to be. But anyway, this is another story that I will take me another hour or so to give you the details of it. But anyway, we were on April the 10th, we were liberated by the Americans in the city of Hanover. So you can find it on the map very easily. And uh, then it's, uh, freedom was also a problem for us. Where do you go? We have no home, you have nothing. You don't even have your clothes down yet. So the final day this hospital or the city of Hanover organized for us that uh, they brought in some clothes for us. And uh, finally we had we were dressed civilly like we and, uh, and everybody was on their own then to decide what to do with. I, you can have my story on the internet. I have a big uh, hundred and some thirty pages. If you want some details, I couldn't possibly tell you here. But if you want to get there, uh, you uh, go and search. Uh, I'll give you the address and you can easily find it. And you can read the whole story of mine. And uh, not only that, I didn't tell you, I was together with my father. And that is the cause or the reason that both me and my father survived. If we would have been separately, neither one of them would have been alive. But the fact that we were together and we sort of living for each other it caused us to uh, live through it all and, and come out alive. So if you want to know the address, I'll uh, give it to you. Uh, you have it there? Um, I, I, I don't offhand, but um, young, I'm young sure. Young people's synagogue. Okay. It's got my YPS and then um, there'll be a... Come here. There'll be a ballpoint for a chance for it. The uh, YPS slash PGH, right. or put it, or go to the Washington Museum, the Holocaust Museum and put my name in there, and you will come to my stories. Sam Gottesman, G-O-T-T-E-S-M-A-N, and put in Hanover or so, just to, to identify it, and you will find my book. It took me about six years or so to write it, and I think I uh, made a pretty good job for it. <laughs> so anybody who wants the details of my l life, it uh, takes about five hours to read it through, and then you'll get all the details 
uh, a little bit after the, la the liberation and so forth. So uh, thanks a lot for coming and visit us. Thank you. Yeah. Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah, I was supposed to go to the army, but my uh, physical didn't come out too good, so they said that you're not fit to go into the army. By army, I don't mean the uh, regular uniform army, Hungarian. It was mostly laborers, and they sent us uh, into Poland, to Russia. As a matter of fact, I lost my brother somewhere in Russia too. He went in as a soldier, but then later on they changed on. They took the, all the Jews boy from, out from the army and they put him into the labor camps and he was lost. We never know uh, what happened to him. I lost my mother, my married sister and a little baby of five years old in Auschwitz, also a younger brother. One, two sisters died in Bergen-Belsen and uh, let's see what my dad, of course, and I survived. But the, from the uh, seven children, two or three of us, ah, one of my sisters survived Bergen Belden, there where she lost two of her sisters. And so my father and I survived, and my, one of my sisters survived. And, we finally got together after the war in Budapest. So, but there is, a, as you re get to my story, then you're going to read the details as to how it happened, what happened. Any other questions? Sir? When you say you were liberated, that would be, that was when the war was declared over? Yeah, that's when the war was over. That's, that's, when, that's when we were celebrated by the Americans. The war was still on. For the Americans, it was still on. But the, they, the Americans they liberated us right in Hanover. They were still fighting afterwards. They, that's why they told us to stay in here, don't go out, because there was firing over everywhere. There was the, the American army and the French were all fighting there. The French, the uh, uh, British, uh, liberated Bergen Belsen. That's where I lost two sisters. One survived, so there was all over us. And I lost my uh, grandparents in in Auschwitz, and I lost aunts and uncles and cousins. As a matter of fact, I have a a, a picture that was sent to America to an uncle of ours in New York of a wedding that happened way back home. And there the family was together on the wedding. So we, I have a bunch of families right on there. And this is the only picture that we have because we left the house op wide open, we had nothing there, we didn't take anything along. So the picture was here in the United States. And then they sent us the pictures and this is how I got the picture. And I see all the families that were lost. The first three rows were all killed right the first day they came in into Auschwitz. They were the youngsters, kids, from uh, six, seven years old and up to uh, 14. And there were the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents all on those three rows of person. The back ones were the younger ones, the 28s, 25s, and they were, some of them were still alive. And the other ones were just simply disappeared. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you only take one thing from this? One lesson would you want it to be? What lesson would you want us to learn? What lesson would you want people to learn from your story? A lesson. One lesson in your story. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> well, you have this picture today, too. You have to look at the papers. You see what is going on in the world. 
There is your lessons right there and then. Hate is all over the place. Everybody hates somebody else, and they always think they are better than uh, what ever happened. Look what's happening to Europe. You guys may be, unless you read the daily paper, you don't know what's going on in Europe. Europe is practically lost as far as I am concerned. The, not the Europe that I knew before World War II, but this is not the Europe anymore, and they, you don't even know what's coming yet. The future doesn't look good for Europe, regardless what the paper says. So, uh, so again, it's hate, hate, and hate again. Let's see. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.